Well, hello and welcome back. In this lecture, we'll be covering chapters 9 and 10 in your text. And the topics are interpersonal communication and friendships, professional relationships, romantic and family relationships. I've elected to collapse these two chapters together as they were both pretty short. Now, it may come as no surprise to you, but of all the species uh, in, in the world, humans have the most diverse and complex system of communication. Consider what humans would be like if we were unable to communicate with each other uh, with our language. We would uh, basically revert back to a primate type culture. Um, so knowing how to communicate within your relationships is, is critical. Um, I, I studied sociology and one of the things that, that was explored was uh, man's ability to communicate and how this has helped us to overcome our environment. We are not naturally predisposed to, uh, to be able to uh, conquer our environment on our own. But when you put us in groups together um, and allow us to communicate with, with one another, we can uh, achieve amazing things as we have today. And if we were unable to communicate, uh, we would not be able to share ideas, technology, um, share what we need, um, express love and gratitude and all of these things without the ability to communicate. So I think it's valuable to explore um, communication across all of, all of your relationships. Now, why is it important to develop and maintain relationships? Uh, there are a number of reasons, and you may ask yourself this, why do I need my friends? Um, some, some ideas that the text suggests are for support, um, for friendship and in times of need, for collaboration, to be able to work with others. Um, as I had discussed, the, the evolutionary ramifications of that, being able to share ideas and technology, to work together uh, for health benefits. It is a fact that people with good relationships in their life, with satisfactory or satisfying relationships, meaningful relationships, they live longer. Married couples generally will live longer than uh, folks who are single. Uh, but really the, the key here is having good friends and good people around you and, and healthy relationships it will help to lower your stress and people with lower stress have increased immune systems this is one of the things that we have found is that people with uh, with chronic stress have depressed immune systems and are more open to uh, to becoming sick and to developing um, things like cancer and such so people with healthy meaningful relationships with others will live longer so it's very important for you to have uh, healthy solid relationships in your life so why are we attracted to certain types of people uh, we may be attracted to their physical appearance uh, we may be attracted to their personality or we may be attracted to them based upon their abilities um, and so these these cover physical attraction social attraction and task attraction respectively uh, in the next slide, we'll, we'll touch on physical attractiveness. I haven't spent too much time on social attraction, but that is basically being attracted to someone's personality, uh, their, their character traits, who they are, aside from just the, uh, the shell, their, their physical appearance. Um, task attraction is being attracted to someone based upon their abilities. So um, perhaps you, you are a, a, an outstanding athlete and you form relationships with other outstanding athletes, uh, regardless of of how they look or what their personality is like. That's task attraction. So in the next slide we'll explore physical attractiveness. So to explore physical attractiveness a little more, uh, what is it that the average person finds attractive? And now this differs by culture and by gender, but speaking in some broad terms, this is, this is what we as people generally find attractive. Body and facial symmetry uh, features that are proportional, that means your body features that are, um, you know, even with each other as, as we would see what a, an average person would look like. And finally, healthy. Uh, I've included a picture, uh, the lower left here, if you do a Google search for the um, ugliest celebrities, this fella pops up and his name is Lyle Lovett and he's a fantastic uh, country singer, songwriter. Uh, but if you look at his face, his proportions or his facial symmetry is, is remarkably off. He has one ear that is larger than the other. Um, he has, uh, his smile is clearly 
way off balance. Even if he's not smiling, his nose is, uh, is it pulls to the left. Um, but very, very non-symmetrical. And I've actually seen um, his face used in other presentations talking about attractiveness. So I'm not really picking on Lyle Lovett, just using his face as an example of what uh, is generally considered not attractive. Um, if you really want to, you can certainly search Google for some of the ugliest celebrities and a number of people will pop up. Uh, and the folks on the on the right here are a good example of, uh, of healthy people. And, and we generally will see this as attractive. Sometimes uh, we'll see things as obesity or, or skin problems or um, a thinning of the hair, or just, just random things. We will identify that with a snap judgment that maybe this person isn't quite healthy and it will diminish our physical attractiveness. I wanted to touch upon the... Uh, the old concept, the old idea here that opposites attract. Uh, this is generally not the case. Though while people are dating when they're young, they may date people that are, are strikingly different from themselves. Uh, generally, when lasting relationships form, there is a lot more in common between the two individuals than, than there is different. Um, we will develop and maintain relationships with people who are more similar to us than different. And if you find couples that have been together a long time, they may seem like they have polar opposite personalities, but if you really spent time to uh, write out on paper all their character traits, their value systems, all that, they would chances are they would be a lot more alike than different. Now, social exchange theory, this is one of the topics that was covered in your text, and it suggests that we form and maintain relationships simply because they benefit us more than they impact us negatively. The, the benefit outweighs the cost. So think about uh, a friend that you have and ask yourself, does this relationship, uh, am I only maintaining this relationship because I get more good than bad from it? I think that to me this seems like it diminishes the, the importance or the, uh, you know, some of the, the, the specialness behind relationships, but uh, I guess for analysis, perhaps it's, it's helpful. Next, we're going to explore friendships. Now, here are the five uh, common characteristics of friendships. This is for to call somebody your friend. We generally will will have these things present. First, that they're voluntary. The relationships are voluntary. Nobody can force you, truly force you to be somebody's friend. You can for be forced to have the appearance of being somebody's friend, but a real friendship is not forced. Usually, develops between peers, and that is people of the same perhaps socioeconomic status, or perhaps the same profession, perhaps students of the same school, um, you have something generally in common. Um, it is governed by a set of rules. Now this is interesting because we wouldn't normally think of our friendships as governed by rules. But if, if you consider this, um, you might see that they are. And so a common rule for a friend is that you are not going to uh, speak bad about me to other people. Um, that you will also answer the phone when I call or return my call. Um, there are some expectations that are, are set up around what it means to be a friend. And so we could, we could classify these expectations as rules. Uh, friendships differ by sex. Um, men are more likely to share uh, friendships based around common activities, um, you know, watching football or, or the like, whereas Women are more likely to uh, develop uh, a wide multitude of friendships based upon a, a variety of things. And the dynamics within the, the relationships are, are um, quite different based upon the, uh, the gender. Now, again, we're speaking in broad terms here. I'm not trying to be uh, sexist, but this is kind of common for the, the, the gender extremes between men and women. Uh, and all friendships have a lifespan, and some of them may be from uh, the time that you are age five all the way up to the time that you are age 50. Some of them, uh, some of the best friends that you have in college right now, once you graduate, you may never talk to them again, or you may, um, but a lot of times the relationships that we form are brief and they, uh, the lifespan is short, but good to consider. I think I've pretty much covered this slide as I was explaining these concepts in the last slide, so let's go ahead and skip along. Uh, considering that you're all college students, um, I thought it might be helpful to just include a little bit about when you move into the workplace, 
some some good ideas to bear in mind and that it is it is important for you to have good relationships with all of your co-workers this will increase your overall job satisfaction uh, you know the, the amount of time that you spend at work all of these things if you spend a similar amount of time investing into these relationships that you might with your friendships or your family you'll find that you are uh, a lot happier at work um, it's it's important to acknowledge that the relationships you build at work are at work relationships uh, and it would be helpful to stay that way um, a lot of you know it happens quite often that people begin dating at the office or wherever they might work and uh, the relationship falls apart and so now not only have you lost the relationship but uh, you've made an extremely uncomfortable environment for yourself at work. Now pictured here are Jim and Pam Halpert from the, uh, the show The Office and they are the exception to the rule but generally dating in the workplace is not a good idea but having relationships specifically because it is good to have positive relationships at work I think uh, bearing that in mind will be helpful to you in your future career. Now exploring communication in your romantic and family relationships, the, uh, we, can, we can break down some, some different types of communication, um, you know, classify different family units based upon the way that they communicate with one another. And, and we might look at these as validating, uh, volatile, uh, avoidant, and hostile. And for validating family units, uh, they generally they will speak respectfully to each other, they will really listen to one another, and they will come to mu mutually beneficial resolutions for each other. Um, and, and these generally will be the, the happiest and most peaceful uh, type of relationships to be fully supportive of one another and really listen, really listen. The next type is volatile, and, and these folks, these, these family types, communicate uh, with one another, and uh, they, they work to get the other to agree with their uh, point of view. So trying to constantly uh, challenge the other, maybe in competition, to have their idea, um, you know, their idea approved or won over, or it is their way only, and I, I, I need to, uh, to swing you to my opinion here. Uh, the next type is avoidant, and that is, uh, those are couples that, that deal with conflict indirectly. They, uh, they feel that these, the, the problems that they face may ultimately work themselves out, so they're not even going to go there. I think that there could be strengths uh, and weaknesses to, uh, to this, this type, but I think the, uh, one of the, the tenets here is that these couples can, and these families can agree to disagree with one another and try and let the problems work themselves out. And I think that concept of agreeing to disagree is very powerful. I think that that can be a great way to uh, to end conflicts, that uh, I don't agree with you, you don't agree with me, and that's fine, let's agree to disagree and move on. Finally, uh, hostile type relationships, or hostile as we might pronounce here in the South, uh, will openly express frustration and anger. These are commonly relationships where, uh, you know, at the extreme end there's domestic violence, but at the lesser end, uh, yelling, arguing, um, a, lot of, a lot of uncomfortable stuff, uh, very critical of one another. Um, yeah, so I might, might challenge you to consider what type of relationships, according to these four types, is validating, volatile, avoidant, and hostile. What type of uh, relationships do you have in your family and with others around you? And uh, if you're not satisfied with that, maybe challenge yourself to try to change. Now, this notion of communication climate, I think, is, is quite interesting. Uh, the, the idea of a communication climate is the tone that we set as we engage in communication with others. Um, so if we are very critical of others around us, then it could be said that we are creating a negative communication climate. Whereas if we're supportive and, and, uh, and have a lot of humor, a lot of uh, love and, and solid attachment, it could be, could be said that we have uh, a positive communication climate. And what communicate? I would ask you, what communication climate do you feel that you generally set with others around you? How do you communicate with others? Are you positive and upbeat, or are you are you down? Are you uh, low in energy? All of these things will will impact the nature of your relationships and how others see you. Now, this is true for all your relationships, be it uh, at work or at home, in your intimate relationships with your friends, with your family. 
the importance of simply listening. The impact of being heard by those closest to you is much more impactful than ever offering or receiving advice. Just really, really listening to what people have to say around you will make all of your relationships better.